Hi, everyone. I'm Sue Boffman from the Association of Research Libraries. And let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you to our workshop on the focus group method. Uh, thank you for joining us for the first of a series of workshops that we are offering to our colleagues who are participating in our Research Library Impact Framework Initiative. Uh, this is an initiative that's been underway for a little bit of time, and many of the colleagues on our call today are members of teams across our libraries who are working on five different research questions. Um, they've been busy during their research on a variety of topics, including space, uh, special, collect special collections, um, productivity issues, diversity, equity, and inclusion issues as well. Uh, we decided to open up our workshops to our team's colleagues, and it's nice to welcome all of you uh, today with us um, as well. We're really pleased that you could join us and spend part of your day with us. As I said, this is a series of workshops that we'll be offering, and all of you are welcome to attend all and any of them. We'll provide more information about the series after today and provide you with um, information about the the different types of workshops that we have coming up and how to register for them. Our workshop leader today is Margaret Roller, uh, our, one of our consultants who's been working with us on this initiative. And I know she's looking forward to uh, talking with you today and sharing a lot of good information uh, and practices and tools and tips with you about focus group methods. Uh, so Margaret, without further delay, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you and put myself on mute. Okay. So Okay, well, thank you, Sue. And hi, everyone. And I am excited to be here today. Let me go ahead and start sharing my screen with you. Hang on. Okay, there we go. Uh, let me say from the get go that I have a lot of content here today, and I'm well aware of that. I'm, I've, I've purposely kept it. Uh, kept it here in here for today because um, because when this is all said and done, probably I'll, I'll, probably tomorrow I would guess I'm going to send the slide deck to Sue, and uh, I want I want you to have this information. So yes, there's a lot here. I'm going to begin by talking about qualitative research and the focus group method kind of overall, some kind of general comments, then um, then get into quality considerations moderator and moderating considerations, and think into online mode. And these first three um, areas I'm going to cover today really, I think, provide the needed context for, because I know that the online mode is something that many or most of you are um, interested in, like most people these days. Um, but I think what I'm going to go over before I get there is going to be useful when we get into talking about the online mode. So a lot here. Let's get started. And let's begin with what is qualitative research, which may seem a little nuts to some of you. But um, I, first of all, I have I've learned that um, people have different definitions of what qualitative research is. But more importantly than that, really, is that you need to understand where I'm coming from. When I talk about qualitative research, you need to understand where I'm coming from to, to give context and understand um, what I'm talking about as I go along in our discussion today. So this is what I mean by qualitative research. Goes beyond the obvious and the expedient. It is not quantitative, quantitative or survey research for sure. And the focus really is on context and interconnections, which is another way of saying that <clears throat> that questions are related to each other. So an answer or response I get to any single question really more, more contextually lies in the responses, um, the feedback I get to a whole bunch of other related questions. Here are 10 attributes that I associate with um, qualitative research. And I have highlighted here four of them. Uh, the importance of context, meaning the relationship between the participant and the researcher and the researcher as an instrument. And I, I've done that because uh, in my mind, those four really serve to drive much of what qualitative research is. But of course, there are six other unique attributes as well, as you will see there. Now, the focus group method. Now, focus group discussions, 
in the old days, nobody knew what a focus group discussion was. Now everybody knows what a focus group discussion is. But, but the reason for this slide here is to emphasize the, um, the, the, the point of interaction and that the whole point of focus group discussions or one of the main key points of conducting a focus group discussion is to, is to understand and to um, realize the interaction among participants and, um, and what added information that we get as qualitative researchers when we when we see and hear that interaction and 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 key when we look at strengths and drawbacks to the focus group method indeed one of the key strengths is the is the dynamics is the group dynamics it among other things can stimulate recall you know you, you might have a group discussion with with students let's say and and it's only in the discussion that somebody says oh yeah i remember i remember now going to the library website i had forgotten i had done that or things of that nature so it, it also spurs spontaneous ideas and thoughts it allows the moderator to hear people think out loud and that um, uh, goes back to what i talked about earlier in terms of interaction and being able to be attuned to and listen for the interactions among participants, which indeed may do what? May change people's be, uh, thinking about something. That would be human nature, but that would also be interesting for the researcher to understand how maybe that came about. So thinking out loud and listening for that is important. It can create a supportive environment. Um, if you are conducting uh, group discussions with students with certain uh, learning disabilities, um, it can create, again, a, a, a supportive environment which may um, provide um, good information for the researcher as well as um, a positive experience for the participants and clearly can offer a wide range of attitudes and behavior. Now, drawbacks or limitations to the focus group method, right on the top, you'll see exactly what I just said are strengths, which are group dynamics. Group dynamics can also have the kind of the, the, the drawback of um, stifling different, differing attitudes and uh, personal input it can lead to group think, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and for the moderator, it can be difficult, difficult to control. It may not also be appropriate for certain types of participants, such as executives might not be appropriate for certain topics and there may be ethical considerations so for instance you know what you talk about in a group discussion should ideally stay within that group discussion but the reality is is that you have no control over that and what participants talk about outside of the discussion um, you never know uh, so that has to be a consideration as well I want to shift now into quality considerations, and I'm going to draw a bit on this um, this this book that Paula Vakas and I wrote back in 2015, and um, the whole point was to kind of talk about qualitative research in um, in the terms of quality, and specifically um, something we call the total quality framework, which is I'm not going to go through this framework, but I'm bringing it up because I want to draw on that first component you see there, credibility, which has to do with data collection. And um, credibility has to do with a few things. Um, one has to do with the scope of your research, which has to do with coverage and sample design. So the scope simply is asking the researcher to think carefully about you know, how well do your participants actually look like or characteristic of the population that you're interested in. Um, if you're working with lists, how complete and accurate are they? Um, we usually use purposive sampling in, in qualitative research. And again, if you're working with lists, you know, are you able to, and if you are, do you stratify them? And when you recruit, are you working through the entire list? These are all the kinds of things we also think about in, um, when designing quantitative or survey research as, as well. One of the things that falls into this category of scope is the question of how many focus groups do I conduct? Well, um, unlike what some people may tell you, I guess, um, is that it depends. There are some folks who will say, oh, you know, you need to recreate, you need to conduct four groups to do this or six groups to do that. Uh, I would suggest to you from a quality standpoint that 
uh, the number of groups you conduct needs to be considered at a couple of stages within the process. One is at the design stage. So where are your, your participants? Where are the people that you want to draw into your focus group discussion? What is the depth of your discussions do you imagine them to be? You know, how, how much alike or not alike do you want the participants to be within a discussion? Um, what expected variations do you think are going to be the outcomes of your research? And of course, scheduling and money and human resources are always, always a consideration. But I would suggest to you from a quality standpoint that you also think about how many groups to conduct when you're actually in the field, when you're actually in the field conducting groups. And when you look at the groups that you've conducted to ask yourself, questions such as, gee, you know, have I covered my, and, and addressed my research objectives and the key constructs in the focus groups I have conducted? If not, do I need to go back and maybe add on, you know, conduct more groups or somehow, you know, um, you know, or conduct more groups or go back maybe even to the groups that you already conducted and complete what didn't you wasn't completed in terms of objectives and um, constructs. Does the moderator, does the moderator really understand the outcomes of each discussion? And that may sound a little crazy, but uh, if I can't, when I come out of a group discussion, if I can't basically in my own words, tell you what I learned in that discussion as it relates to the objectives and the key constructs, then, then I need to go back and, and revisit that group or maybe we need to add on and conduct more groups. Uh, have there been variations in the data that uh, can or cannot be explained? Has Have all of the participants in all of the groups we've conducted so far participated in, in, and shared their experiences? And how have the moderator skills, have they met high quality standards for all the groups that have been conducted or not, or not? Another aspect of scope has to do with non-response. Now non-response, you're gonna hear a lot of course in survey research and non-response error where we talk about it a lot, but we also talk about it in qualitative research from a quality standpoint because have the participants that showed up to our group discussion, how are they the same or different than, um, than the people who, who, who didn't show up. So um, gaining cooperation from participants is very, very important. And there's a number of ways to do it, which I list here. The other aspect of credibility or data collection um, within total quality framework has to do with data gathering. And here we're concerned about validity. How valid are our outcomes? And there are three ways to think about that. One is in terms of the content by way of the moderator's guide. Another is by way of the researcher effects and another by participant effects. And concerning the guide, the, the guide development is, is, is critical for the validity of your outcomes. And the guide, what's important here is that the guide is a guide. It's not a script, uh, it's to, give you um, an idea of the general flow of discussion, the kinds of topics and questions you're going to cover, the kinds of prob probing questions you might consider as the moderator. And it has a funnel um, design. And what I mean by that is that the moderator's guide goes from, from broad to narrow. I think of it in terms of four stages, with the first couple of stages where we're gaining general information on the, on the participant and the topic, topic of interest, and then moving into stages three and four, where, we, where we're narrowing down to what we really want to talk about to our, our, what we're really our focus is of the particular research we're conducting. Here's a quick example of so a focus group study I did for Michigan State University, for example. These were actually online groups. They were asynchronous groups with faculty and staff concerning the um, university's outreach and engagement office. And what we wanted to, we wanted to learn uh, the kinds of outreach and engagement activities that faculty and staff were engaged in. Um, we want to understand what resources they were using to support them, but but our re but 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 our real goal, where we go, where we where we were going with that, is uh, to understand what the MSU um, office uh, office of outreach and engagement could be doing 
differently or better to support faculty and staff. So we started off with just understanding their definition of outreach engagement, their activities, and then we moved into stage three where we asked about their resources and then their awareness of, of the MSU uh, Outreach and Engagement Office and how this office has or has not assisted them. And then stage four, what we really wanted to know, which is how could the office better support them and what would make a world-class um, office and engagement resource for, for these people. Moderator bias is another consideration when you're considering the validity of your outcomes. And there's a number of ways that the moderator can bias the outcomes clearly. Uh, I've just mentioned a few here and there's more to come as, as you'll soon see. Uh, giving selective attention to participants in a discussion or, you know, voicing their own opinion or losing track of group dynamics, um, which can happen, of course. Even their physical uh, appearance can have an effect. What can help mitigate um, uh, moderator bias is something called a reflexive journal. And we're not going to get into it a lot right now, but I just wanted to throw this on the screen to give you an idea of the kinds of things. The, the, the journal is basically a diary that the moderator can reflect on uh, and complete after a group discussion. And this is really true for any qualitative method. So the moderator in this case can, can think about, well, what, you know, how did my personal values and beliefs maybe impact the questions I asked or my listening skills or, or things of that nature? So this can be a way for, again, to help mitigate moderator bias, but really reflecting on the moderator's behavior and thinking. Moderator inconsistency can also impact the validity of your outcomes. And, and I will tell you, and, and any of you who have moderated know this, that it's a big challenge to fully engage a group of participants with a very limited time. And, and, and therefore, it's um, not so unusual that group dynamics may not be well managed or that group dynamics might actually get away from the moderator a little bit. And in, when that happens, one of the outcomes, one of the things that can happen, of course, is that um, the guide, as just one example, the guide is not fully covered in a discussion. So maybe the, the moderator had to jump the midsection of the, um, you know, maybe of the, of the guide and go straight to what I just showed you, stage four, and get to some of the ending questions. And if that's true, that really has, um, that really has um, uh, really jeopardized the integrity of your, your outcomes. So you need to be very careful of that. Now, the last point on this slide you'll see is, is, is the idea that moderator inconsistency can happen because the moderator has not um, in, a, in a consistent way presented concepts or definitions. So for instance, if you were doing a group discussion and the main focus objective of this discussion was to understand participants' reactions to let's say a uh, new on-site library service. And that really was a, a big um, objective of your research. If the moderator from group to group does not actually um, state, or in my case, I would always, I, I read something, read the exact same description or definition of this new, um, new uh, on-site library service in order to gain participants' reactions, then, then the moderator has jeopardized the validity of the research um, simply because group participants from group to group are, are uh, reacting to different versions of what this concept is. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, interpersonal qualities of the moderator, I think goes without saying, And but why is it so important? Why is it so important to have strong interpersonal qualities? It's because it's those qualities in the moderator that really help build support and a trusting environment. 
And that's important because that is how the moderator is going to enable and motivate participants to share their candid thoughts, which, and that's important because <laughs> that is how the moderator, the researcher gets closer to, um, to the research objectives. There are four key broad moderator skills. One is being highly organized. Maybe that seems kind of obvious. Uh, moderator needs to be very well prepared. There's a lot of little things that need to happen, such as confirming participants and making sure the platform or the facility is all set up and moderator has all the materials. I've highlighted here this idea that the moderator has internalized the guide. And I can't, um, can't stress that strongly enough. It's important for the moderator to come into a group discussion, having really absorbed the guide and absorbed the key objectives and contract constructs that need to be investigated in that discussion. So that when things happen in the discussion, uh, group, dynamics and all the things that can happen in discussion, which will happen, the moderator is prepared because the moderator has, again, internalized the guide and exactly what the moderator needs to be getting out of this discussion. So clearly, um, in be, being able to manage time, the discussion, to cover all the topics and to cover the objectives um, is is an important skill of the moderator. And again, I would suggest to you part of that, if not most of that comes from having internalized the, the, the guide. Has to be a leader without being overwhelming. It can exhibit control, um, but, and knows how long to stay on a topic and when to move on and importantly, what to move on to. Now that becomes very important when participants are making, maybe taking the discussion in in other directions that you hadn't planned, um, but because you have really absorbed, you know, the the guide and the objectives and all of that, you're able to say, okay, I need to move this over here. I need to move this conversation back, and I need to move on to whatever it is. And you can do that effectively if you've, if, again, if you absorb the guide and all. And how to speak firmly but respectfully, and 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 showing a lot of respect is, of course, goes back to building building rapport, being open-minded and flexible, being objective, you know, that goes back to not interjecting your own values and the reflexive journal and all the things that we've already um, talked about, uh, to be able to deal with unanticipated events, because believe me, it's going to happen, whether it's something just participants, don't, not all participants show up. Uh, a participant gets angry or upset, and trust me, this happens. Um, there might be last minute changes to the guide. There might be all, any number of things that the moderator needs to be flexible enough to adjust to and to deal with, which is another way of saying they need to be good at logistics, whether it's setting up the room or dealing with technology issues or whatever it is. And the moderator needs to be attentive. And I say here, think on your feet. And I mean that regardless of mode, whether it's in person or online, the moderator needs to be able to, to, to listen carefully to each participant while at the same time, um, uh, following the, each participant's thread. So, you, so the moderator is being clear about each person's Kind of life story as it relates to our research objectives, while at the same time um, staying attuned and listening carefully to the interaction between the participants um, and what is going on with that interaction. And as I've already mentioned, the ability to identify and assess um, unanticipated topics as they, as they show up. So those are kind of skills, but what are some of the techniques? Um, so, something I've already kind of said, and here's maybe just a different way of saying it. The moderator needs to be very clear about, um, uh, about each participant's attitudes and behavior related to what we're talking about in the discussion. But at the same time, 
be very clear and understand where the group overall is coming coming out uh, in terms of their attitudes and opinions um, and behavior with respect to our research objectives. You know, verbal and nonverbal um, uh, techniques are obvious ways uh, to get at, at any of this. Now, in terms of direct questions, uh, there are, you know, th you know, three, the three C's of direct questions. Context, um, I just threw up here just a couple of examples of these, of the three C's of direct questions. Um, here is, you know, you know, context, what is your process for exploring uh, scholarly literature relevant to your research? Um, but from there, we might want to actually have participants compare and contrast for us. So we might say, to what extent, if at all, do you use specific scholarly databases, Google Scholar, the, the college university library website, website or an all purpose search engine in your process. And then you might even want, you know, want to some clarification. And I've, the example I put here is, you know, you mentioned earlier that you use whatever sources were mentioned in your process to explore relevant literature. Um, are these also the sources you use to stay current with scholarship in your field? Now, I'm, I've done a whole webinar on the why question and we're not going to get into that right now. But let me just I'm going to just throw this slide on the screen and just mention and just and just make the comment that the why question is not always the right question. And it's interesting because um, many people all the time will tell you that the reason we conduct qualitative research uh, focus like focus group discussions is to get at the why question you know survey uh, survey questions and survey research tell us the what and qualitative research tells us the why and i'm just here to just mention to you that the why question is not always the right question and to think carefully when you are writing your questions for your discussion guides the reason is is that the why question can put participants on the defensive. Um, you, you're now asking them possibly to justify their attitudes and behavior for you. And so they're having to kind of search for a sense of response to you that makes sense, uh, which is going to stop the flow of conversation. It also can cloud the meaning. And the example that I use here is if you ask the question, why is the library important to your research? I would suggest to you that that is a confusing question. But if you ask what are the specific aspects of the library that make it important to your research, that has that is something that the participant can grab hold of. They can understand that and say, oh, you want specific aspects. I can now think of specific aspects. Um, also, the last bullet item, I would suggest to you that when you rethink your why question, that you consider the idea that um, you may not be asking the question that you think you are asking. Um, the example I use here is if you ask the question, why do you use Google Scholar? Again, I would suggest to you that may be um, essentially a different question then what are the benefits you derive from using Google Scholar compared to other databases? So I just point here is when you do your moderator guides, um, think carefully about the questions, of course you will. And when you're just about to put down a why question, just to think very carefully about that. I know I do. And, and, and let me say, I use the why question. Everybody uses the why question. I, I understand that and I do, but I, well, every time that I am inputting a why question into my discussion guide, I am thinking carefully whether or not it's the right thing to do. So. Uh, in, another way to, to kind of indirectly ask questions are under the category of what I call, or what a lot of people call enabling techniques. So enabling techniques include sentence completion, word association, um, storytelling, and I give you a few examples of, of what that may be. So what about nonverbal techniques? And there's a bunch of nonverbal techniques. One is just silence. 
and uh, allowing, allowing participants to think about your question before answering. So silence, which is another also another way to say, be patient for slow talkers, for shy participants who I'll mention again in a minute. Um, and for maybe you've asked a pretty personal question that's difficult to answer. So be patient and silent. Actively listening. What's actively listening? It's, it's making eye contact. It's nodding your head. It's smiling. It's all those kinds of things. When I do, um, particularly when I do in-person groups, I use the easel, just your basic easel a lot or a whiteboard if it's there. Um, I kind of like the easel, it's very tactile, but the whole point is to um, use it to kind of, um, it, it says to the parent, the to parent, it says to the participants, I hear you. I'm listening to you and it really helps kind of facilitate and create energy in the discussion. And I say here, be approachable, which um, basically means again, smile. And, and I've mentioned before, dress appropriately. I'm a big believer and I've been saying this for years now that um, whenever I do an interview or a group discussion, uh, unlike today, <laughs> I wear an open collar. Uh, just because an open collar, I believe, says to whoever it is you're talking to, your participants, that hey, I'm here, I'm open to, I'm open to what you have to say to me today. I'm going to not spend much time on this at all. I'm I'm going to kind of um, um, flip through. You're going to have this in your slide deck. Uh, I wanted you to have it. I'm going to flip through various participant types, and you will see that I will mention the participant type and then provide um, a way to maybe as a moderator to um, deal with various participant types. So one obviously is the, is the uh, dominator, person who wants to dominate the discussion. And kind of what I put a hostile argumentative participant, someone who has an ax to grind. And I, in, if you have not had that experience, trust me, um, it happens. And there are various ways to deal with that. There mentioned, I mentioned just a, a little while ago, the shy participant. Uh, and um, I have many experiences. I think we all do, whoever has moderated of shy participants and there's many ways to, to deal with shy participants. Um, yeah, group think is, um, and I've mentioned this before, but it's something that the moderator really needs to pay attention to because all of a sudden you go, wait a minute, the group all seems to be agreeing with whatever it is we're talking about. How did that happen? Uh, so there are, and, and this happens on a fairly regular basis as well. So here I offer a, a few ways to deal with that. Straying from the guy, um, this happens too. And, and in, this can actually be a good thing uh, because maybe they, maybe participants have strayed off the guide into a territory that you hadn't anticipated, but hey, it's really interesting. And you as the moderator thinks, hmm, I hadn't anticipated this, but this is interesting. And I think ultimately relevant to our objectives. Uh, but those are decisions that moderator needs to make you know, in the moment, but be aware that this, can happen, obviously. Now, for an in-person discussion, it's not um, it's not unusual for uh, side conversations to pop up, and there's a, a number of ways to to deal with that. Okay, online mode. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, there are. Um, I've just put down here synchronous and asynchronous um, focus group discussions. Synchronous is um, probably more common. It's the video conferencing and asynchronous being uh, they're called bulletin boards or, or discussion boards. There are um, a number of advantages to the online mode. And, you know, it used to be, <laughs> used to be uh, not that long ago, like, just maybe a year ago, that 
uh, I would have this discussion and this would be all the news to whoever it is I was talking with. But now after a year of um, the pandemic and a year of uh, many of us moving to the online mode, many of you are probably already aware of what I'm going to mention now. So clearly uh, uh, some of the advantages can be that you get greater coverage uh, and therefore you can have a more kind of representative um, uh, looking group of participants in your discussion. It can be more convenient for, for participants. It may be more appropriate for sensitive topics and it could be a relevant form of communication depending on, on the kind of participant that you are, you are uh, after in your research. It can also provide greater accuracy, I put down here, and more in-depth information. And partly what I mean by that is, for instance, in the online mode, you can gather multimedia, you can get text, you can get video, you can images, you can get you know, a multimedia approach to the responses to your questions. It also, particularly for the asynchronous mode, you can get very detailed and thoughtful responses, which also <laughs> I'm here to tell you can also um, be a disadvantage be just because it is overwhelming and then you have to deal with it. it but it also can mit mitigate, particularly in asynchronous mode, can mitigate recall, recall area, error. Now, the last point I have on this slide is that it may be an efficient use of resources. Now, the reason I say may is because uh, indeed, you will not have travel expenses. You will not have food expenses um, because we, we feed the participants and observers. Uh, however, the cost of uh, the online platforms can be the same as the cost of a focus group facility. Uh, and for the asynchronous mode, when you, um, when you um, conduct bulletin boards or discussion boards, that can be twice as much as a in-person facility rental. So it's not necessarily a better use of resources. And also if you're paying an incentive or co-op to your participants, that is pretty much gonna be about the same. You're not gonna save any cost in the online mode. So online mode, uh, it may help you in, in the resources you spend, but I would um, be very careful about that because it may not be true. Drawbacks to the online mode, there are a few. Um, managing the engagement takes a lot of skill and a lot of time. Uh, it's important to pick up cues and in the online mode, I put asynchronous here, but even in the synchronous mode, it can be difficult to pick up. It's not like being in person. So it may be difficult to pick up the kind of visual and verbal cues that you would expect and normally get in the in-person mode. I just, as I just alluded to, the analysis can be overwhelming and that you may have lots of data in terms of just volume, particularly again, asynchronous, lots of text um, data. Uh, but in synchronous or asynchronous, you may have in text, but then you may also have video and images. You may have the, in the online work I've done, um, participants have sent me documents for me to read, to support the things they were saying to me in the discussion, all of which it becomes part of the data. So it can become overwhelming. Fraud or misrepresentation uh, can be a problem. Security, internet access, technical um, uh, glitches and difficulties. And um, for the asynchronous mode, text-based communication can be an issue because it, that is its um, primary and key form of, of input. Now I have put some of these strengths and limitations um, into this schematic you see here. And, and remember when I talked earlier about the total quality framework and the credibility or data collection component of the framework, and it has two aspects, scope and data gathering. And here I've just simply um, helped visualize a few of the things I just talked about. You'll notice that um, one of the things I have there, I didn't mention earlier as being a, an advantage 
uh, under researcher effects are the um, platform features, which can help mitigate bias uh, and inconsistency. And these platforms have a number of features. And, and, and as you see here, the, the, the number of qualitative research de dedicated platforms are many and they're growing every day. Just in the last week, I have gotten um, got information on a brand new quality research online platform that I had never heard of before. So it's it's growing all the time. And they are continue to grow in terms of, particularly in this past year, out of demand, their features have continued to grow. Now, this is not something that wasn't, you know, that's new to in the past year, but as an example of some of the features is they have markup features where you can actually have participants mark up an image of some kind to gain their feedback. They have um, uh, heat maps that you can have um, participants engage in. They also have uh, other types of participant exercises like collages and mind maps and just your know, video feedback and visual elicitation and, and things of that nature. Uh, this, uh, I conducted uh, online um, focus groups for the EPA uh, in 2011. And this is just a screenshot of where I managed the participants. And I have to tell you, I spent a lot of time on this page because managing participants in the online mode, and this is in this case it was the asynchronous online mode, uh, can be very time consuming and uh, difficult if you don't have a good, efficient way to understand who's been in to respond to your questions, who has not been in to respond to your questions, who do I need to follow up with, who do I need to uh, respond to, um, and that kind of thing. Who is who has you know? And, and actually, it was this study I alluded to a few minutes ago when I told you um, some participants gave me documents to read. This was a study with behavior and social scientists, and a number of them gave me research and literature and things that they had been involved in for me to read in response to some questions I was asking asking them. So um, a lot to take, a lot to keep track of. And, but these online platforms do a good job of, of helping you do that. They also, this is from iTrax. Those screenshots I just showed you a few minutes ago, uh, up until now, were all from 2020 research. Um, and what I'm showing you right now is from iTrax research. And just to show you their um, observer room uh, feature and how the observer and moderator can, um, can talk to each other. And this is, uh, this is from iTrax, but other platforms have the same thing. All of these platforms are offering very similar features, maybe done slightly in a different way, but, but very similar. These, these, on, these dedicated qualitative research platforms also, in addition to kind of features I've already mentioned, also provide full text support. You get automatic transfer, uh, transcripts and translation, um, edible um, uh, video, uh, security features, and many, most of them have panels from which they can recruit. So they can also, if in your case you ever you needed recruiting, they can also handle recruiting. So they're multi-featured in, in terms of what they can offer the qualitative researcher and the focus group uh, researcher. Now, just quickly, in terms of a few of the design considerations, uh, I've put up here so that you can kind of contrast and compare. In terms of number of participants, the in the in-person mode, we may be um, we may have in our discussions anywhere from two to ten. Now, grant you, there are some moderators that might bring in twelve participants or more, maybe. I doubt more, but they might do more. Uh, my, my kind of limit is 10 and my, my favorite number is eight for um, the number of participants in an in-person group. For the online synchronous uh, mode, the 
most qualitative researchers, at least in my network, and, it's, and, and what my recommendation is, is four to five participants. Of course, you can have more, you can have fewer, but four to five seems to be a sweet spot in terms of um, getting a good interaction and engaged group, but at the same time being able to manage it in the online mode. In the asynchronous or bulletin board or discussion board mode, uh, I, I, you know, I'm putting, I'm recommending here anywhere from eight to 18 and I, with the, the caveat that uh, f uh, fewer is better, again, in terms of being able to manage it. And having said that, and I'm saying that because if you went to some of these online platforms I've already mentioned and told them that you want to conduct a discussion board, they would, uh, might say, okay, fine, you know what, we can, um, um, you can have as many as, as 30 participants in your discussion board because our online platform will handle 30 participants. And I would just suggest to you, and I hope it's obvious by now, that 30 participants is just, of a, of a two or three day discussion board is just overwhelming, not only to manage and to facilitate, but then in the end to actually be able to do something with the data and do an analysis and a report. So length of discussion in person is usually 90 minutes to two hours. Uh, the, uh, the synchronous online mode, usually 60 to 90 minutes. And the asynchronous is, I just, is two to three days or longer or shorter. I mean, it could be a day, but usually they're two to three days. Cooperation is important in, in, in all of our research, for all the reasons I mentioned earlier in terms of the importance of gaining cooperation, but it can become particularly important in the online mode because we are also dealing with this whole issue of technology. So the, um, the idea here is that it's important. So the idea is you need to over-recruit and we over-recruit even, even in you know, in-person mode. Uh, we always over recruit uh, because for whatever reason, not everyone will show up. Uh, but communication here about, uh, among other things, about the technology to, is important. So to include in the recruiting process, not only through screening participants um, concerning their qualifications for the discussion um, and, and things of that nature, but also about your intended use of technology, their comfort with that, that technology you're going to use, their comfort with um, be having their webcam on and using video in the discussion. It needs to all happen at the recruiting, pro recruiting time, but also in the communication you will do after recruiting. And you do a lot of communication after recruiting in terms of confirming the recruit, reminders, in all those types of communication. It's important in addition to, to confirming and, and mentioning again about the, the date and the purpose of the research and why it's important that they show up, is to also mention again the technology and to mention again that your intention is if you're conducting a synchronous um, online discussions that you expect them to have their webcam on. The, in terms of moderator considerations, I would suggest to you that the qualities and skills that I mentioned to you earlier really uh, don't, um, are, are equally important in the online mode as they are in the um, in-person mode. So everything we talked about before, I would suggest to you again, are just as important in the online mode. In terms of techniques, the moderator needs to pay attention to the, to the fact that there will be differences in the online mode in the participant interaction. Typically the interaction, participants will be less interactive, which means that the moderator is going to need to have to call on participants, um, particularly if the moderator has not upfront made the participants comfortable in how they should um, interject a comment or interact. 
So if I'm a participant and I'm a little bit nervous being in this discussion with some people I don't know, any of these people, I don't know the moderator. And if I don't know exactly how, how is, am I supposed to just talk or am I supposed to raise my hand or what am I supposed to do? What I'll do instead then, if I'm uncomfortable about all that, is I'll do nothing is, uh, and I will just sit and be quiet. So participants need to understand how they can, can interact. The moderator will need to pay more attention than in the in-person um, mode to the flow of discussion, the flow of the conversation, because it will be more difficult and they may indeed need to um, interject some more, um, some exercises or things of that nature in order to uh, stimulate and maintain some energy. And maybe it goes back to some of the things I've already mentioned to you when I showed you those screenshots. You know, maybe it's marking up an image or things of that nature. And the moderator needs to um, pay attention to the fact and be aware going into the discussion that participants may be distracted. You know, I mentioned earlier this idea in the in-person mode of side conversations. Well, on the on, in the online world, um, participants just may be distracted and need to step away. And the moderator needs to be okay with that. Um, and needs to be okay with allowing the participants to turn off their video. The moderator cannot rely so much, you know, I talked about earlier about active listening and kind of nonverbal techniques. The problem here is that relying on eye contact or just, just, just the feel and the sense of the group that you, you get when you're doing uh, discussions in person may not be there in the online uh, mode and probably won't be. And, and the moderator will need to, again, look at some kind of an exercise or something or be very explicit in the, in the questions that are asked in order to feel good that, that the moderator is gaining back um, from the participants what, what is going on in the discussion. It may be, um, I put down here a poll, it may be that the moderator wants to interject a poll because you're not quite sure how they're feeling about something. So you might put a poll on the screen to get a feeling for, about that and then, and then jump off from the poll with a whole slew of various questions. And as I've, I've alluded to and just say here specifically, the moderator needs to be more direct. All of this is to say that the moderator in the online world is going to need, need to be more direct and um, be more focused. Okay, so that kind of comes to the end of my slide content. I have here, this is a blog that I have about 250 articles in this blog. I have a few, um, a few uh, uh, addresses here that you can go to, one having to do with the framework I mentioned, another having specific to focus groups, but there's, there's a bunch of other stuff there too you may or may not be interested in. And here's my contact information. I'm happy to connect with with any of you. So that's it for me. Um, if anyone has any questions, comments, we have a few minutes left in our session. I'd be happy to, to talk about them. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so everyone, if you do have a question, uh, there's two options. One, you could pop it into chat and we can all see it. And I will work with Margaret to make sure uh, we share the questions or you can raise your hand. And if you'd like to do that, if you hover over the bottom of your screen, uh, if you haven't done this before, there's a, a icon that says reactions. If you click on that, there is a option to raise your hand. Um, but yes, please jump in if you have some questions. And while you're all thinking and getting organized about, about your questions, Margaret, could you talk a little bit um, about the guide? And do you have 
Um, and perhaps even a, an example of a good one that you might be able to share or could point people to some references where they might get some tips on what, the, what a guide looks like. Um, sure. Um, let me make myself a note. Um, and I can send that to you, Sue. Sure. And we can make sure it gets distributed or uh, everyone has access to it. Sure. I think that's, that's a good idea. I will do that. Um, and give you a feeling for that. And, um, I'm thinking maybe what I might do, Sue, is send you an example of an in-person, a discussion for the in-person mode, for in-person discussion, and then for um, the online mode. For, um, and I'm, well, I'm thinking about maybe the Michigan State example I used. Maybe I'll send you the guide for that. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Any questions? If you don't have questions now, you know, fine. Um, I'm happy to address any questions or comments um, after today. So feel free to contact me. Okay. Well, I see Michael has a question. So Michael, un why don't you unmute and jump right in? Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, I was curious, um, especially since the pandemic has uh, befallen, has come to all of us, um, a lot of online uh, interaction has involved really large groups. And um, I know I've participated in meetings with 200 or more people. And I'm wondering, oh, ouch. Uh, you know, these are like, some of them have a discussion format. And, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, um, this reality of some um, of those kind of interactions involving so many more people and what the unique challenges are. And, uh, you know, I realize those are not framed always as literally a qualitative research project, but we seem to be doing it a lot more. I'm just curious on your thoughts on those large groups and, and how we bring some, do we bring some of these ideas to that or, or not? You know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Um, a little, a little difficult to answer only in that I, you know, so what I'm going to say, Michael, is that it will depend, of course, on your objectives. Uh, clearly, if, if the objective, is, and I don't know if these are group discussions where in the end, somebody has to report back what went on in the discussion in some kind of reasonable way and uh, or as we do in research, make interpretations, that kind of thing, then, then clearly, you know, we go back to what I've already said about keeping the group small and that kind of thing. For a group of 200, I'm just, I'm, I, I, I don't know what the purpose of a group of 200 would be, <laughs> is what I'm kind of struggling with. Um, so I don't know, is the, so is there, so there's a, a moderator or a facilitator for these large groups, Michael? You know, I think, um, well, I think in higher ed, we are seeing, um, you know, a faculty meeting would be like uh, either in a large academic department or an entire group of faculty. Um, yeah, and I, you know, I really appreciate, I think when I think about it, um, the question seems to come back to what is the objective when that is happening? Um, right. And I mean, I haven't studied it, but but I just know that a lot, very large groups are getting together in that way. Um, and also, as we know, because um, often in the past, they would have been inside a physical space. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so mm -hmm. they're, and they're online in large numbers. Yeah. And I'm... And, and one of the considerations there may also be that um, the person organizing that discussion is really one of the, the areas of focus is being all inclusive. I don't want to leave anybody out. And so I want to create this inclusive environment and it winds up being 200 folks on in this discussion. 
um, which is, of course, a very different thing than when we have, have very specific research objectives and we're very targeted at, towards those objectives. And, and it's all about how are we going to answer the research question mm -hmm. that's based on the objective. And that is our goal and that is our, our, our focus going into the discussion. And, and as the researcher was saying, well, how is that going? To, how am I gonna make that happen? Because in the end, I, in the end, I have to analyze that and yeah. I have to make sense of it. And I have to provide my interpretations and recommendations based on that and write a report. Yeah. So, so that's where my focus is. If my focus is to, is to have a discussion among faculty, my objectives are very different, I'm, I think. And one of which may be this all-inclusive idea. Right, right. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Other questions? Sue, can I ask a question? Can I um, can I get a feeling for how many of these folks are or have conducted focus group discussions? Why don't I, let's see, if I can set up a poll, why don't I do that? And then that can spark, maybe we can get people to respond. And in the meantime, uh, we have a question from Gordon that is, um, which is, what is the best way to select participants for a focus group? Hi, Gordon. I, um, unfortunately, participants um, um, come in different shapes and forms. And uh, so it's difficult to, to say there is a way, a best way to um, to recruit a focus group participant. Um, it will really, so going back to what I said at the beginning of the discussion, if you have a list of students, of faculty, of uh, community members possibly, you would utilize that list in, in the ways that I've already talked about and um, you could, and then, and then you can send out emails. I say that, but what's very important is that you also contact them by phone. And I'm hesitating here because typically what we've always done is we've done it by phone. We, we usually have some kind of list, even if it's the, uh, the qualitative research providers panel database, uh, we would begin by getting on the phone and recruiting participants and going through that list. Uh, these days, going by way of email may be uh, more appropriate to start, but even if you do that, you need to follow up with phone um, so that uh, there is a connection between participants and the moderator. Gordon, I don't know if that answered your question, but that's a very broad answer to your question, I guess, which is um, start with email or phone. If you start with email, make sure you follow up with phone. Don't know if that helps or not. So Margaret, I have put together a poll. Um, so may I launch it real quick and then we can get back. There's another question that's surfaced. I see, I'm looking at chat. I do see. Um, but go okay ahead. to launch. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, All right, here it comes everyone. I didn't title the question. Um. Answers are still coming in.
Looks like everyone has voted that's planning to. So let me end the poll. I'm going to share results. Can okay. Everybody, can you oh, see yeah. that? Most of them have. Yes, I do see that. Yes, most of them have. Okay, great. Okay, good. No, but would like to. So we have what almost 80% saying no, yes or no, I would like to. Okay, great. Yeah, great. Okay, good. So you do have a question that's come in from Beth. Do you see it or would you like me to read it? Um, let me see. I see something from Jessica. Oh, maybe that popped oh, in. No, she's that. just responding. I, I see. Okay. Um, Beth, could you talk a bit about using snowball sampling as a method for identifying participants in a focus group situations where it may be a useful technique and those where it may not be a useful approach? Yeah, the problem with snowball sampling and why we use purpose of sampling and discourage convenience or snowball sampling is for the obvious reason that um, with snowball sampling, you're, you're jeopardizing the integrity of, of your data if, you're, if you are simply recruiting um, people who know people who know people who know people. Um, because you, uh, it's a, which is a very different approach, right? Than um, looking at a, a, a list of, um, uh, of potential participants uh, and then systematically going through that list. I don't necessarily want to have in my discussion, people who um, were recommended by one person, let's say I recruited one person and this one person now has brought in a whole bunch of other people. That is not, that's not a quality approach obviously to the focus group method in that now I have people who may be of the same way of thinking, uh, may not be very dissimilar in their, what we call lived experiences uh, and in maybe whatever character, their lifestyle, whatever it is. And that is not what we are looking for when actually when we conduct um, any piece of research. Um, when it may be useful, it may be, you know, having said all that, it, come, it, it, it has and it may come into play when you are dealing with, um, uh, 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 what I'll call scarce or hard to reach segments of the population. Um, people who there may, be, there may not be great numbers of them. You don't have a list. You don't have any way of that contacting them. Um, they're few and far between. And you have to go through targeted groups or individuals in order to gain entry to, to the kinds of people who you are um, looking for. You know, this in a way goes back to the very beginning where um, I didn't leave it on the screen that much, but I think of one of the last items on that, gain, gain, how to gain cooperation. I have on that list gatekeepers and gatekeepers can be very useful in uh, helping to helping the researcher gain access to population types, particularly those that are hard to reach or just are very few in number. Uh, the problem though you have to always keep in mind is that um, you could be jeopardizing your research. Maybe you're not, maybe you are dealing with such a selected group that it is very appropriate to take this method. Um, but you just need to be very, very careful about what you're doing and need to document it, uh, not only for the analysis to be thinking about that, but actually in the reporting function, you need to document that that's exactly what you did in your sampling. Thanks, Margaret. There's, I think, one last question before we run out of time this afternoon from Michael about the a facility moderator. Do you see that? Um, can you also share your opinion that if a library is holding 
focus groups, whether it makes a difference for the moderator to be directly affiliated with the library or a third party moderator. Okay. Um, as a, just a, as a, you know, a, a flat answer here, my recommendation would always be to, okay, to bring in a, a trained, skilled outside moderator. That is who is going to, to have all the qualities that I shared with you today in this session. That is who you, so ideally, yes, I, I am, my recommendation is always for bringing in a skilled moderator from the outside. Um, uh, having said that, and I know that sounds self-serving because I am that kind of outside moderator, but I don't. So, but, but, but having said that, the reality is that for, because of time, because of money, because um, you just don't know um, another, you don't know an outside skilled moderator, you may lean towards using someone um, in the library to moderate. And that's just life, that's reality. I understand that, I get that. But what I would suggest to you and strongly suggest to you that when you go that route, that you are very careful that, that that moderator is trained and is skilled in all these things that we've talked about. And that, um, that including the guide development and all the things we talked about, we haven't talked about analysis reporting, but we will talk about that. Uh, later in other workshops, but uh, for for today, just to make sure that that whoever you take on board is is skilled in those areas as as much as possible. Thank thank you, Margaret. Um, Beth, you were appreciative of, of Margaret's response and said you would like to make a comment in 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 our the last couple of minutes that we have left. Oh yeah, thank you so much. I was just just rapidly trying to type it. Um, <laughs> I worked with a, a team on a study a few years ago where, and, and this sometimes happens, I think, in the library world, where you're trying to um, you're trying to gauge needs or or something about a community of uh, of scholars that is is really far flung, and so it's hard to there's no list. There's no, you know, yeah. Yeah. association that they're members of, or you know, and, it, and there are no gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that that um, the the team that I worked with did was to to we identified a few people, um, did individual interviews with them, and used um, those interviews to seed a list. And then we carried out a scoping review on that topic so that we could uncover as many names as we could who'd been publishing in this area. Great. Good. And so we kind of used that to, um, to sort of um, hold up against the list we were coming up with mm -hmm. by talking with people Great. with snowball sampling. So that was something that that's a, yes, it takes time to do a scoping review, but mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, if, sure. if you just work up your Zotero and get your team together, yeah. that's one thing that, you know, we librarians sort of know how to do. That's and great. It, I yeah. love that. How creative. Great idea. I love it, that. It's not my idea, but it worked really <laughs> well. Regardless, it's a great, yeah. I love it. Thanks Thank for sharing you. that. That's yeah, great. thanks. So, Margaret, we've come to the end of our time. Is there uh -huh. any last comments or words you wanted to share with the group before we say thank you and send everyone on, on their way? Right, I just, well, I do wanna say thank you and um, I'm glad you were all here today. And I would just repeat what I said is, if, if there's any follow-up discussion or comments or questions that any of you have, please don't hesitate to get in touch and I'm happy to talk about it. Great, thank you, thank Margaret, you. and thank you again for the, your workshop on the focus group method. Thank you all, I'll add my thanks to all of you who attended, thank you very much. We will follow up uh, by sharing the recordings uh, from today's session as well as last week's and uh, Margaret's slides, and she's offered graciously to share some examples of um, guides. Um, so stay tuned and we'll be sending information about our future workshops coming up. 
Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll okay. say goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.